At the height of the Cold War, the threat of nuclear Armageddon sent the world into a panic. Fearing an invasion could happen at any moment, both the Soviet Union and the United States built up their military capabilities, constructed vast nuclear arsenals, and in the event of a national emergency, built secret underground bunkers. Spread over 11,000 acres of sprawling West Virginia hills, the Greenbrier Resort was an unlikely yet perfect location. From the mid-1800s on, the Greenbrier has really been a fashionable place to visit. Cam Huffman is director of public relations at the resort. Politicians, actors, actresses were visiting, and five U.S. presidents visited here even before the Civil War. It's a mark of society if you get to come and stay at the Green Bar, and it's still that way. The hotel's involvement in the Cold War efforts began in 1955. The U.S. government had tasked the Army Corps of Engineers with scouting locations for a subterranean bunker where members of Congress could safely shelter in the event of a nuclear attack. Having already served as a military hospital during World War II, the Greenbrier was ultimately selected because of its proximity to Washington, D.C. and prior relationship with the U.S. government. Constructing the bunker, codenamed Project Greek Island, was a huge undertaking. People in the military and in the government were thinking the question of when there's a war. These two superpowers are going to be sending bombers across the ocean, and Washington would be a primary target. Bob Conti has worked at the Greenbrier Resort for over 40 years and is an expert on its rich history. The government drew what they called the Federal Arc. So within 300 miles of Washington, D.C., was a series of emergency relocation centers. It wasn't really a matter of protecting certain individuals. It was a matter of keeping the constitutional framework of our government. So you're going to move the leadership of the federal government to these facilities. Congress here, the executive branch to another facility, the Defense Department to another facility. They would stay in contact with one another, and they would provide continuity of government. It was really an audacious idea. Construction on the bunker began in 1958. To keep their plans under wraps, the resort came up with a cover story that they were adding on a new wing to the hotel. The Greenbrier at the time didn't have air conditioning, and we're kind of at a time in history where air conditioning was becoming popular and, and needed in hotels such as the Greenbrier. So they were able to build the West Virginia wing and use the story that they needed rooms that had air conditioning, so it worked out perfectly. Neither the hotel staff nor the locals caught on to the real reason behind this major addition. People knew that there was a construction project going on. It was just what was beneath that people didn't know about. One of the techniques they used to keep it secret was hiding it in plain sight. Construction of the new wing provided the perfect cover for the real work that was being done underground. They built a wall around it so that people couldn't see exactly what was going on. At 112,544 square feet, the two-level facility was roughly the size of two football fields stacked on top of each other. The bunker is basically a giant concrete box that has two foot thick concrete walls reinforced with steel all the way around it. It's buried under 20 feet of earth. It took 50,000 tons of concrete to build it all. It obviously took a massive crew to build the whole thing. The Greenbrier bunker was built to accommodate 1,100 people, 435 representatives, 100 senators, and all the associated legislative members and their support staff. This was no small project. The bunker, for all intents and purposes, is a giant concrete 112,000 square foot box. And it's vulnerable at the entrances and exits. So thus, you need to have blast doors to protect those openings. This is an 18-ton blast door. This is where the hotel meets the bunker. Now, you can't have an 18-ton blast door sitting in the middle of your hotel without raising suspicions. What you're looking at here is just a cover door 
that fit right over this. In the 30 years that this uh, bunker was sitting here, I walked by it thousands of times and <laughs> never thought, oh, I bet that's a cover door and there's an 18-ton blast door behind there. The bunker was part of a larger continuity of government program. In the event of an international crisis, the entire property would be used as a meeting place for members of government. This is called Governor's Hall right here. There are 435 seats here, 435 members of the House of Representatives. There would be meetings here. There would be deliberations on legislations. They'd be taking votes here. Down the corridor is a second room that could accommodate up to 100 people. This would have been the Senate side. All this was aimed to provide continuity of government to the American population in the face of a catastrophic war. To ensure Congress could communicate with the military and what remained of the public, the necessary technology was put into place. 1,300 telephone lines running into this underground facility. In contrast to the resort's premier accommodations, the bunker wasn't outfitted with five-star amenities. The dormitories consisted of 18 rooms, each built to house 60 people in metal bunk beds. These are some of the bunk beds that were installed in the bunker back in the early 1960s. There were 1,100 beds. The dormitories took up about 30% of the whole square footage. For all those years, every member of Congress had a bed assigned to them. But for all that it lacked in comfort, it made up for in preparedness. In the event of a nuclear attack, how would this underground fortress maintain a constant state of operational readiness? And nearly 30 years after its construction, how did one journalist blow the bunker's cover? During the Cold War, in the event of a nuclear attack, the United States Congress would have been taken underground to a decontamination room beneath the Greenbrier Hotel. So you would take all your clothing off, you would just put it right down in here because it's contaminated. There are a series of shower nozzles. It's a matter of high pressure, good water. Wash any contamination that would have attached to your body. Pass through these doors, and it's time to get a new set of clothing. Good old US Army fatigues. And then you walk directly into the bunker proper. Among its other features, the bunker had a kitchen stocked with enough food and water to last for 60 days. So we're entering the cafeteria. Who knew <laughs> that back behind their closet was this cafeteria? It also had a medical clinic, equipped with a state-of-the-art operating room, a dental unit, and 12 beds, as well as a fully stocked pharmacy. While guns, straitjackets, and riot gear were in place if needed, the bunker also had its own secure water supply and three separate generators, each capable of powering the bunker on its own. All this was fueled by oil. Every Wednesday night, for 30 years, they fired up these generators here. They did this in the middle of the night. For three decades, the Greenbrier bunker was maintained in both a constant state of operational readiness and complete secrecy. Members of the Greenbrier staff, they were the plumbers and the electricians and the air conditioning guys. They were cleared. They had signed non-disclosure agreements. We're pretty stiff, you know? I mean, you sign one of these things, and it tells you right above your signature how long you're going to be in jail and how big the fine is going to be. So, so people were pretty serious about not talking about this. But at all times, this had to be available to the Congress of the United States. Having worked here throughout the 70s and 80s, Bob's experience shows how every day, hundreds of people came within inches of the U.S. government's top secret operations. This was the office of Forsyth Associates, our audiovisual consultant. They repaired televisions. And one of the little perks of working here was you could bring your television. He would come in here, Chuck and Bob were here, you shoot the breeze with them. But Chuck and Bob would both have been government employees. Their job was not to fix TVs, but to guard the bunker and keep it ready at a moment's notice. Unbeknownst to me and everybody else that this was the dividing line 
between the overt part of the facility and the covert part of the facility. The bunker remained a complete secret to the outside world for more than 30 years. Then in April 1992, reporter Ted Gupp, who had been investigating rumors about the Greenbrier for several years, finally persuaded someone to talk. When he arrived here, he actually had a map of the, of the facility where all the rooms were, a, an accurate map. So once he showed that, it was pretty clear that he had some good sources. They spent quite a bit of time at the Washington Post should they publish this story, and finally they, it was decided that they did not think uh, that this would affect national security, so they went ahead with the story. Ted Gupp's article contained explicit details of the classified bunker, and the government immediately reacted. It was no longer deniable. The next day, the Speaker of the House, Tom Foley, announced, we're closing down the bunker. In the three years following the article's publication, the legal relationship between the Greenbrier and the government was dissolved. The bunker was really sort of prepared for everything except an article in the Washington Post. There, there really wasn't a plan for how to shut this down. Equipment from inside the bunker was removed and transferred to other government properties. And on August 1st, 1995, the bunker officially became the property of the Greenbrier. The very first thing we started doing was giving tours. Serving as a tour guide, Bob immediately got full access to the areas that had been hidden away for more than 30 years. To, to say the least, I'm, I'm, I'm peeing in my pants. I'm pretty excited, you know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually see this bunker. We walk through those doors there, and we go into the kitchen. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, this looks like a high school cafeteria kitchen. This is the secret bunker I've been hearing about for years. I mean, it was right here. It was right next to this exhibit hall where I've been a thousand times. Today, the Greenbrier Bunker offers a unique and quite terrifying reminder of how close the world came to nuclear war. It gives us an insight to what life would have been like for the chosen few sheltered deep below a post-apocalyptic world.